Mr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. And good afternoon to everyone online and uh, in the room. First, as usual, the numbers. In the past 24 hours, uh, China reported uh, 329 cases. They lost in more than a month. As of 6 a.m. Geneva time this morning, China has reported a total of 78,959 cases of COVID-19 to WHO, including 2,791 deaths. Outside China, there are now 4,351 cases in 49 countries and 67 deaths. Since yesterday, Denmark, Estonia, Lithuania, Netherlands, and Nigeria have all reported their first cases. All these cases have links to Italy. 24 cases have been exported from Italy to 14 countries, and 97 cases have been exported from Iran to 11 countries. The continued increase in the number of cases and the number of affected countries over the last few days are clearly of concern. Our epidemiologists have been monitoring these developments continuously, and we have now increased our assessment of the risk of spread and the risk of impact of COVID-19 to very high at global level. What we see at the moment are linked epidemics of COVID-19 in several countries, but most cases can still be traced to known contacts or clusters of cases. We do not see evidence as yet that the virus is spreading freely in communities. As long as that's the case, we still have a chance of containing this virus. If robust action is taken to detect cases early, isolate and care for patients, and trace contacts. As I said yesterday, there are different scenarios in different countries and different scenarios within the same country. The key to containing this virus is to break the chain of transmission. Yesterday, I spoke about the things countries must do to prepare for cases and prevent onward transmission. The report of the WHO China Joint Mission has now published its report, which is available in English on the WHO website and will also be posted in Chinese on the National Health Commission website. The report includes a wealth of information and 22 recommendations for China, for affected and unaffected countries, for the international community, and the general public. It calls for all countries to educate their populations, to expand surveillance, to find, isolate, and care for every case, to trace every contact, and to take an all of government and all of society approach. This is not a job for the health ministry alone. At the same time, work is also progressing on vaccines and therapeutics. More than 20 vaccines are in development globally, and several therapeutics are in clinical trials. We expect the first results in a few weeks. But we don't need to wait for vaccines and the therapeutics. There are things every individual can do to protect themselves and others today. Your risk depends on where you live, your age, and general health. WHO can provide general guidance. You should also follow your national guidance and consult local health professionals. But there are 10 basic things that you should know.
First, as we keep saying, clean your hands regularly with an alcohol-based hand rub or wash them with soap and water. Touching your face after touching contaminated surfaces or sick people is one of the ways the virus can be transmitted. By cleaning your hands, you can reduce your risk. Second, clean surfaces regularly with disinfectant. For example, kitchen benches and work desks. Third, educate yourself about COVID-19. Make sure your information comes from reliable sources. Your local or national public health agency, the WHO website, or your local health professional, everyone should know the symptoms. For most people, it starts with a fever and a dry cough, not a runny nose. Most people will have mild disease and get better without needing any special care. Fourth, avoiding traveling if you have a fever or cough. And if you become sick while on flight, inform the crew immediately. Once you get home, make contact with a health professional and tell them about where you have been. Fifth, if you cough or sneeze, do it in your sleeve or use a tissue. Dispose of the tissue immediately into a closed rubbish bin and then clean your hands. Sixth, if you're over 60 years old or if you have an underlying condition like cardiovascular disease, a respiratory condition or diabetes, you have a higher risk of developing severe disease. You may wish to take extra precaution to avoid crowded areas or places where you might interact with people who are sick. Seven, for everyone, if you feel unwell, stay at home and call your doctor for local health professional or local health professional. He or she will ask some questions about your symptoms, where you have been and who you have had contact with. This will help to make sure you get the right advice, are directed to the right health facility, and will prevent you from infecting others. Eight, if you're sick, stay at home and eat and sleep separately from your family. Use different utensils and cutlery to eat. Ninth, if you develop shortness of breath, call your doctor and seek care immediately. And tenth, it's normal and understandable to feel anxious, especially if you live in a country or community that has been affected. Find out what you can do in your community. Discuss how to stay safe with your workplace, school, or place of worship. Together we're powerful. Containment starts with you. Our greatest enemy right now is not the virus itself. It's fear, rumors, and stigma. And our greatest asset are facts reason and solidarity. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Um, with this, again, we will start in the room with three questions and will then go online. For those online, please, either with your comments from Zoom, click raise your hand on the display, or if you're dialing in by phone, star nine to flag your interest. And in the room, we'll start with Gabriela from Mexico, and please introduce yourself. Thank you. Gabriela Sotomayor, Mexico uh, Proceso. Uh, Dr. Tedros, Mexico just confirmed two cases of coronavirus uh, related to Italy. Uh, my, my question is, um, what is your advice, and is there less risk in Mexico because of the weather, it, because mm -hmm. it's, it's hot in Mexico right now, and it's the ending of the uh, influenza season and the importance if you can clarify really to Mexican population the importance uh, or the difference between mitigation and containment thank you very much so thank you for the question um, so 
we were talking a little bit about this yesterday about the weather and if there's differences there. I mean, we this we need to um, think of this virus that it can transmit the same as it as it does in China, as it does in Mexico, and be ready for that. Um, and the recommendations that we have for all countries are the same. Um, and that recom those recommendations are to expect cases, um, to identify them very quickly, um, to isolate them and care for them, identify their contacts and follow those contacts over 14 days um, to ensure that we, we take care of them and that we stop that onwards transmission. We're, we're still only seven, eight weeks into this outbreak, into this uh, into COVID-19 outbreak, um, and we're still learning a lot about the virus. Um, right now, there's no reason to think that this vi virus would act differently in different climate settings. Um, we will have to see what happens at, as this progresses, but we, we need to be as vigilant as possible um, in all countries of the world. And on the issue of uh, containment and versus mitigation, uh, in public health terms, containment are the activities that are aimed at interrupting transmission. In other words, identifying cases, isolating cases, following contacts. You're trying to sp prevent the virus transmitting from one person to the other. So the measures that are taken are trying to break the chain of transmission. You're trying to contain the virus in that sense. Um, mitigation is when you accept that you cannot prevent the virus spreading. But what you do is mitigate the impact the virus has by treating patients, by uh, offering a vaccine, by doing everything possible to reduce the impact uh, on society, on the health system. But both of these strategies are, are necessary in, in, <coughs> in many epidemics. Uh, what we've been saying uh, clearly is that containing the virus and interrupting transmission gives us an opportunity to stop the virus, but what it's clearly doing, as you've seen in China and Singapore, it's slowing the virus down and allowing us to get ready to prepare. Uh, to accept that mitigation is the only um, option is to accept that the virus uh, uh, cannot be stopped. Uh, and we've seen evidence from China that this virus can be significantly curbed in its spread if robust measures are taken. Thank you. Um, and we have a question, Chinese open from China Central Television. My question is about the virus origin. So right now there have been some opinions published by the scientists saying that they are not sure about the virus. Are they really from China or from some other parts? And also there have been no clear evidence that this other virus is coming from China. So my question is, are there any updates about the virus origin? Because there are some cases not related to the travel history in China. And although they, the first cases are spotted in China, does it necessarily mean that the virus itself came from China or it can be somewhere else? Thank you. So this is an area of active uh, investigation right now, of looking at the source of this outbreak, the zoonotic source of this outbreak, that is, what is the animal source for the initial human cases. Um, and there's a lot of activity in this uh, area of work. Um, we, as you know, um, some of the initial cases uh, identified in, in December um, from this cluster of pneumonia had mentioned this uh, exposure at the seafood market, but some of those cases, some early cases, didn't have exposure at that market. And so what's really important is to go back and look at those first uh, cases, the first 50 cases or so, and say, you know, what are the exposures of those individuals and how did they differ? Um, there were some investigations that took place at the market. Um, there was some environmental sampling that was done in the market in, Hubei, in uh, Wuhan and in other area markets in, in Wuhan um, where they found um, evidence of virus in the market in, in environmental samples, so swabs of, of surfaces. Um, there's a lot of area of work of looking at the virus in animals and wildlife um, in the markets themselves, but also in source farms, you know, the, the, where the animals came from into those markets. As far as we are aware from the mission itself and from, from beyond that, we haven't seen any evidence of, of the virus in the animals in Wuhan. Um, there's one paper that um, it mentions the pangolin um, and that there's some close association with, with the, with the COVID-19 virus. Um, and that could be the intermediary host, but that's not the full story. So there's a lot of area of, of work that needs to be conducted to really identify the intermediate hosts. So what are those animals that may have resulted in, in, in exposure to, to people who were infected there? We don't have a clear answer on that yet, but it's an area of active investigation. And <coughs> I think it's also I important in, in, in terms of looking at the emergence of any disease. Disease can emerge anywhere. Coronaviruses are a global phenomenon. They exist on a global basis. 
it's a it's an unlucky accident of history or nature that they emerge in a certain place and it's, it's really important that we don't have to start to ascribe blame to geographic origin uh, and that we uh, we look at this in terms of how we respond how we contain and how we stop this virus uh, Congo is not responsible for the emergence of Ebola Nigeria is not responsible for the emergence of Lassa fever uh, and no one is responsible for influenza pandemic so it's really important that our narrative and our rhetoric is balanced and that we have the discussion we need to have is yes we need to understand the origin of the virus so we can prevent it re-emerging uh, not in a way of trying to find out who's at fault uh, and what poor animal is at fault for the virus the animals aren't at fault for this so I, I think we need to be careful in the language we use uh, because the language of stigma and origin and who's to blame is something that's uh, become an unfortunate part of the global narrative which is not helpful. Thank you and we'll go to our colleague back there. These are indeed families, and they have very little access to plain health services, especially uh, less access to knowledge. Uh, is the World Health Organization reaching out to, to valuing agencies or other authorities to, to determine if there is any spread of the virus there and to help these people? Um, the, uh, the a number of weeks ago, the, the Director General uh, spoke with and uh, wrote to the Secretary General to trigger the UN crisis management policy which uh, resulted uh, in the Secretary General creating a UN crisis management team which uh, I lead and uh, we have brought together all of the key agencies across the United Nations systems the humanitarian the scientific uh, every the World Bank on the finance side UNICEF on the social side uh, we have a core group of 12 agencies who uh, constantly work and interact together and we've created subgroups. Uh, the World Bank are leading on economic impact analysis, UNICEF are leading on social impact analysis, uh, ICAO and others are leading on travel impacts uh, and um, uh, our colleagues at ACHA uh, under the leadership of uh, Mark Lowcock have been leading at looking at uh, humani potential humanitarian impacts or impacts on our humanitarian operations at country level. We've also worked very closely with resident coordinators of the UN system. They are leading at country level in support of governments with the technical support of WHO. So yes, uh, equally there's a, a supply chain subgroup as part of the CMT which is WFP working with UNICEF and WHO looking at supply chains not only for medical equipment but for food supplies for food programs so that global supply chains for uh, many things are being uh, managed uh, we've also integrated a lot of our risk communication work across the, the UN system with UNICEF so I, I would I, I would say that the UN has really come together very significantly for a one UN uh, response and certainly vulnerable populations, particularly those people living in conflict, uh, uh, refugees and migrants in particular, are at the center of our concerns. And Dr. Tedros has, has said this consistently, we are concerned for populations that are uh, in, in zones of fragility and conflict, particularly those people who don't have access to uh, essential health services. They, they lie very exposed, but they're also very exposed to cholera. They're very exposed to measles. They're very exposed to many other pathogens. And, and the, we, have a, we have a huge responsibility not only to prevent COVID-19 affecting those populations, but to also serve them with the basic life-saving uh, interventions that they need. So I, I would argue the UN is, uh, is, 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 has come together quite well on this. Yeah, maybe just to add one, uh, Mike had already said everything. And we also expect each and every country to take care of refugees and migrants in their borders. Mm -hmm. And they should not leave anyone behind because any one case can trigger a fire, actually spark a fire. Mm -hmm. So that's why each country should also be responsible and take care of refugees and migrants within its border. Thank you very much for these comments. And uh, before we go on the line, we'll take one more question from the room from our colleague from Iran. 
on bad reaction from Iran International TV. Dear doctors, um, I understood that, we understood that as early as next week you're going to send a delegation to Iran. Uh, I was wondering what would be the mission of this delegation and who would be participating in the mission? Um, um, yes, we are uh, sending a team. In fact, uh, the team would be there by now, but there are severe uh, issues with getting flights and uh, access uh, to Iran right now. Um, and uh, we thank the, the governments of, of UNEA and other governments who are facilitating the process of not only getting teams, but getting medical supplies and, and other uh, important uh, items. So yes, the team will be multidisciplinary. It will contain epidemiologists, uh, clinicians, and, uh, and uh, prevention, prevention and control professionals. Um, we are sending teams to, to many countries. At the moment, WHO has small teams in 18 priority countries in the African region. We are sending teams to many countries in the Eastern Mediterranean region, including Afghanistan, Iraq, um, and uh, our regional office for the Americas continues to support uh, preparedness across uh, the Americas and, uh, and support our, our colleagues in Brazil and obviously now in Mexico. Our, our job is to be ready to provide technical advice and operational support to any of our member states who request it uh, or require it. But that is placing uh, a lot of pressure on our systems too, as this epidemic uh, involves more and more countries. So one, one more um, uh, uh, to add to what Mike said, um, United Arab Emirates is helping on this and we have discussed with United Arab Emirates and hope on Sunday earliest and if not by Monday, we should have uh, the people on, on, on the ground. And I would like to appreciate the solidarity coming from uh, UAE. Thank you. Thank you. And with this, we go online. I would like to first call on the colleague from the Forbes magazine. Can you hear us? One more time, calling out Hello? to the colleague from Hello? the... Oh, here you go. Hi, this is Lisa Guayco from Forbes magazine. Um, my question is, in terms of the continued spread and growth of the virus, um, how much closer or are we any closer to declaring a pandemic as opposed to epidemic? Um. <clears throat> A, a pandemic is uh, is a unique situation in which we believe that all citizens on the planet will likely be exposed to a virus within a defined period of time. We can say that, and I've said in previous press conferences, if this was influenza, we would probably have called this as a pandemic by now. But what we've seen with this virus is that with containment measures, uh, with robust public health response, the course of this uh, epidemic or these multiple epidemics can be significantly altered um, and to to declare a pandemic uh, it, 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 it is unhelpful to do that when you're still trying to contain a disease uh, a pandemic is also a word that may be uh, attractive at a global level uh, to describe an event but it's not necessarily so if, you, if you're one of the two billion people living in countries with weaker health systems. Because what, in that sense, you're accepting, as I said to my colleague from Mexico, is that you now are entering a phase of mitigation and that you're giving up on the possibility of containing and slowing down the virus. So pandemic as a colloquial term, we've seen the pandemic of obesity or the pandemic of HIV or all of these words that are used. We want to move beyond colloquial terms. If we, if we say there's a pandemic of coronavirus, we're essentially accepting that every human on the planet will be exposed to that virus. The data does not support that as yet. And China have clearly shown that that's not necessarily the natural outcome of this event. If we take action, if we move quickly, if we do the things we need to do, that does not need to be the history of this event. But if we don't take action, if we don't move, if we don't prepare, if we don't get ready, that may be a future uh, that we have to experience and we have to endure. So much of the future of this epidemic is not in the hands of the virus. Uh, a lot of the future of this epidemic is in the hands of ourselves. And those countries who've taken control, who've taken responsibility, have clearly shown that a lot can be done to stop this virus. 
Thank you. With this, we move uh, to Marianne Benitez from Hong Kong. Please introduce your station, please. Hi, yeah. Uh, thank you. I'd like to ask Dr. Sokol or uh, Dr. Ryan about this uh, Hong Kong's uh, move to quarantine dogs, pet dogs, because uh, some uh, a dog has been found to have weak, weak positive to coronavirus. And uh, they're making sure, you know, that these uh, pets would be taken care of by the AFTD and treated if ever, you know, it, it shows symptoms. Or there is also a possibility that there's environmental uh, contamination. The other thing is the mask again, you know. I mean, all, all Japan, Korea are all running out of stock. So what would WHO do about it? Thank you. I will yep. leave the, um, uh, the question on... Uh, man's best friend to uh, to Maria, but on the issue of uh, uh, masks and other protective equipment, yes, there are severe strains on protective equipment around the world. Um, what we're most concerned about, and, and again, Dr. Tedros has said this again and again, our primary concern here is to ensure that our frontline health workers are protected and that they have the equipment they need to do their jobs. So when we talk about protective equipment and masks, we're talking about that very specific specialized material that's needed, and that is under significant pressure. It is inappropriate for that type of material to be used <coughs> in, in, in a general public uh, circumstance. Uh, those countries who are, and many people are, wearing the normal surgical masks, uh, that is something that WHO has been clear on in the past. Uh, wearing a mask can prevent you wearing the mask from giving the disease to someone else. There are limits to how a mask can protect you from being infected and we've said that the, 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 the most important thing everyone can do is wash your hands, keep your hands away from your face, uh, observe very precise hygiene. Uh, Tedros, I think, has just been through the list of things that you, that you absolutely need to do. Uh, having said that, we do not criticize uh, people who wear masks. People do what they feel is necessary to protect themselves. Uh, but the, uh, not having a mask, and again, it's important, not having a mask does not necessarily put you at any increase of contracting this disease. Keep your hands clean, observe hygiene. Uh, that is the most effective thing to do. Um, uh, we are disappointed that uh, we are not able to guarantee uh, proper protective equipment for all healthcare workers, and we're working with many countries and providers to ensure that we prioritize healthcare workers for the most important uh, protective equipment. Maria, on. Yeah, with dogs. regard, thanks, Mike. With regards to the um, results from Hong Kong, so we are aware that there was a dog um, in Hong Kong that tested weekly positive for COVID 19. So we're working with authorities in Hong Kong and scientists in Hong Kong who are testing these animals, um, the dog. Um, and to understand these results and to understand where or if the, if the dog was actually infected or if the dog picked this up from a contaminated surface, for example. Um, and so we're working with them to understand the results, understand what further testing they're doing and how they're going to care for these animals. So we'll have to get back to you on some, some actual answers on that. Thanks. Thank you both. Um, and now I'd like to call on Helen Branswell from Stat News, please. Hi, thanks very much for taking my question. Um, I was hoping you could explain when you think WHO would, um, what, what it, would it take for WHO to say, okay, containment isn't working, focus your attention on mitigation, because there's a huge, there's a huge list to ask countries to try to find and uh, mock, put out every chain of transmission, and there are opportunity costs of trying to do that. Yeah. Um, hi, Helen. Uh, no, and there is, there, there is always a, a trade-off in these two approaches. Um, and uh, we had exactly the same issues when it came to Ebola. Many people said, well, this disease is endemic now. There's no point putting, trying to put the effort into containing or contact tracing. We should just accept and try and save lives and develop a vaccine and use the vaccine. Um, there are always this question, and it's a rational question to ask. Um, and that's a decision we need to make collectively as a global community. What is clear is that countries that have focused in on containment and have done that 
um, they have managed to achieve uh, much. What containment is also doing um, is slowing down the virus. And we've already seen in countries, and quite sophisticated countries, who've had a, a rapid rise in cases in the last week, are having a trouble coping with the clinical caseloads. Um, and uh, we need to keep this virus slowed down because health systems around the world, and I mean north and south, are just not ready. So containment isn't just a, a concept of interrupting transmission and hoping to put the virus back in nature. Containment is a way of slowing down this virus so health systems can cope around the world if they receive this virus. And our determination right now is that health systems around the world are not ready uh, and, and need to be better prepared to absorb the impact uh, of, the, um, of the virus. And that's why our risk assessment today is looking at the risk of spread has clearly in increased, but the risk of impact has also increased uh, because of what we observe in health systems around the world. Uh, as Dr. Tedros has said, it's time to prepare, it's time to get ready, it is time to act, and uh, people uh, need to take a reality check now. Uh, and, and really understand that an all-of-government, all-of-society approach to this, uh, and maybe uh, we, we, we need to uh, maybe stop asking ourselves the questions about is it a pandemic, is it not, is it containment, is it mitigation. We're having very um, good discussions around that. What it is, is time to act. To add to that, to say that, um, yes, it is a lot to ask you know, people to identify all of the cases and to contain, but we have examples in several countries where this has worked, you know, and, and that, <coughs> excuse me, is, is important to remember. It's not just, I mean, we are seeing very positive results, very positive trends in China, which has been incredibly aggressive in its, in its management of this outbreak. But we have seen successes in other countries as well. You look at Singapore, you look at what's happened in terms of the cases that they've had, they're now seeing a, a rapid decline in cases. You see what happened in Nepal, there was an onward transmission there. You're seeing what's happened in Vietnam, where there was some cases and there's no more further cases. These are all examples of, of where countries have been successful in containing this. But the, f the point is, is that the earlier we act, and, and it's been repeatedly said, the earlier we act and how robustly we act, especially in those initial cases, will determine if you're dealing with a, a number of cases, one case or a small cluster, or you're dealing with hundreds or thousands. So it is about being ready. It is about a robust and aggressive um, response very, very quickly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, by the way, I, it has been said, but just would like to add one thing. Um, there are now 46 countries who have reported cases. As I said yesterday, eight of them have not reported for the last two weeks. So you can exclude those. In addition to that, out of the 46 countries, 23 countries have reported only one case, half of it, half of them. And then a good number of them from the half, from the 23, actually have reported less than 10 cases. How can you tell these countries that abandon containment and move into mitigation when they can mitigate it, when, when they can contain it? So it varies from one country to the other. We don't need one size fits all solution. And when you abandon containment, move into mitigation, you're actually undermining something that you can, you can do when containment is possible. So what we're saying is we don't need this dichotomy of either or. Mm -hmm. We need to have all the strategies triggered. We need to start from containing aggressive containment while preparing for any eventualities and using those strategies to also be triggered when we want them. So we don't need to have either or. Whatever we have now, it doesn't dictate that we move into mitigation alone. It will be a mistake, a big mistake, a big mistake. Then I will give you the other angle. 46 countries, but 4,500 cases a spread over 46 countries. We're talking about the population size of this, the rest of the world other than China is how many? Six billion, 4,500 cases. Why are we suggesting to surrender 
when we have 4,500 4, cases in the rest of the world, and when these are scattered over 46 countries, but please don't mistake me. I'm not saying this disease is not serious. It's serious, it's dangerous, but at the same time, there is still a win window of opportunity, although it's narrowing more and more by the day, and where all the strategies we use, starting from containment, can actually work. So let's not really focus on dichotomy. Let's use a comprehensive approach. And um, my good friend Tony Fauci said the, um, uh, what we are saying, the comprehensive uh, approach. You can remind me, <laughs> if anyone can remind me. It's a very blended, that's it. We should not surrender into containment. We should do a comprehensive approach. And countries have already shown that it can be contained. And I told you already, 23 cases have reported only one case each. How can you convince these countries to really go into containment? That's my question. So we should not really abandon the comprehensive or the blended approach. And we should do aggressive containment in each country. And we can stop it. That's what we believe. It's in our hands, as Mike said. But this thing can go whichever direction. We're not undermining the risk. It's there. That's why today we say the global risk is very high. We increased it from high to very high. And we will continue to work 24-7. And our colleagues internally and also externally are working day and night experts, global experts. And we will come up with any recommendations based on the situation we see as we see fit. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Um, we'll have a couple of minutes left. Uh, so let me ask for one more time on the line. I have Financial Times FT, please, in a short question if possible. Thank you. A colleague from Financial Times, do you hear us? Oh, yes, I lost you for a oh, moment. Yes. Thanks. Clive Cookson from the Financial Times in London. I wanted to ask um, Dr. Tedros what practical implication, if any, raising um, the level from high to very high globally has. You've mentioned it a couple of times, but you didn't say whether it makes any practical difference. Is it just a symbolic statement, or should people take practical, um, do pr anything practical with it? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it, it, it doesn't make a, a legal difference to the, the way in which uh, states' parties uh, have to act, or it doesn't change that. But what it, we hope it does, uh, it, consistent with what Dr. Uh, Tedros said yesterday and over the last number of days, that uh, the risks are rising, and as we see more and more countries becoming involved in, in this, and we see a number of countries struggling with containment, uh, the DG, uh, were, and, and remember, risk assessment within our house is done independently within, the, within our house. It's done by a specialist epidemiologic team. It is not determined in that sense uh, at, a, at a senior management level. It's, a, it's an internal three-level process in which we determine the epidemiologic risks of spread, the epidemiologic risk of impact, and then it's presented to us in the same way it's presented to you externally. Uh, and it always ensures that internally there's an epidemiologic brain that is constantly looking at risk and constantly presenting that to us uh, in a way that we have to digest that in the same way that you have to digest that. It's one of the, the internal checks and balances that we've built into our system. The external process of IHR, the external process of the emergency committee, internal independent processes that drive independent risk assessment, and then that ensures that our system is constantly being alerted, pushed, uh, and made aware of risks, uh, and that we, we don't ourselves become complacent in that. 
So that is the process, uh, and raising the risk to very high is essentially s reflecting what's actually happening at a global level. More countries, some countries struggling with containment, and therefore heightening that level of alert, and as the Director General has said, closing that window of opportunity slowly by slowly, uh, while still giving us a chance to fight this. Thank you very much. With this, we go back to the room, um, and I have Stephanie Nilay from Reuters, please. Yeah, Nigeria, it's been one imported case um, in, in Ogun State. Uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit about uh, what your assessment is of um, preparedness there and lab capacity to, um, to, to detect and um, Sorry, to detect and isolate and so forth, uh, contact tracing. I, I imagine you're working with the authorities. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, first of all, yes, uh, there has been a confirmed case in Nigeria. And uh, we were very lucky to have the services of Dr. Chikwe, who joined the international team from Nigeria as the uh, director of Nigeria CDC and is now uh, back in Nigeria. And I'm sure. Uh, hugely empowered by all of what he has seen in China and all that has been done there. Um, and again, Dr. Tedros has spoken many times about the power of preparedness. Uh, the establishment of Nigeria CDC, uh, the uh, fact that Nigeria has been fighting measles, cholera, it's been fighting polio, it's been fighting uh, Lassa fever. In fact, it is an ongoing Lassa fever outbreak, which is a hemorrhagic fever outbreak that requires case identification, contact tracing, and isolation. Um, so Nigeria has a well-tested mechanisms for dealing with these dangerous pathogens. Um, and uh, we, uh, we have great uh, confidence in our colleague, Dr. Chikwe, and his staff to be able to do that containment exercise as we uh, as we explained previously. But that is built on an investment in that surveillance and preparedness in Nigeria over uh, a number of years. The fact that the laboratory there is able to make the diagnosis, that we've expanded the laboratory network in Nigeria for dangerous pathogens because of Lassa fever and monkeypox, that laboratory network is now available to do COVID-19 diagnostics. The fact that we've invested in influenza diagnostics in Nigeria means the same labs who can do influenza diagnostics can now transfer and do COVID-19 diagnostics. Uh, there is nothing new in the world. You base everything you do on the investments you made in the past. Uh, and investing in preparedness, particularly in Nigeria, has resulted in a stronger system. That is not to say that there are not risks. Nigeria is a vast country with a huge population, and it has many vulnerable people, especially in the north, uh, and lots of refugees and, and many others. Uh, so it is disappointing to see the disease arrive, but it's also heartening to see that the disease was picked up on a single importation, was confirmed quickly, and that isolation and other activities have already begun. So Nigeria is doing like any other competent nation. It is seeking to contain this virus, and we wish Dr. Chikwe and his staff the best of luck in that endeavor. So if I could just add to that to say that, yes, uh, you know, Dr. Chikwe was with us in China, and we, we spent, as, a, as the international team, spent a lot of time talking about what are the lessons that we can learn from China that, that impact every country on the planet, including countries across Africa, um, including Nigeria. And there are incredible lessons that can be learned from China as it dealt with, as it is dealing with COVID-19 in, you know, high-income areas, low-income areas, high uh, incidence areas, low incidence areas, uh, areas with migrant populations, um, and 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 a lot of what we learned there is applicable to to Nigeria. So seeing having him as part of that team, having him bring back that experience, um, I think is is a is a great benefit um, to Nigeria along with all of his colleagues there and across Africa. Um, and and as we've said previously, the fundamentals of response, the fundamentals of case identification, laboratory diagnosis, diagnosis um, you know, those apply everywhere on the planet. Um, and so it was, it was really wonderful to have Chikwe with us in, in uh, China and bringing back those experiences firsthand to deal with this. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope we'll have two more, time for two more from the room. Um, Agence Trans Presse, please.
Uh, Nina Larson, AFP. Um, hi. Uh, I was. Want, I want to go back to the declaration that it's uh, the level is very high now in the world. I was wondering, is, do you, would you consider that now? Are we at the highest possible level of alert since we don't, you don't officially use the word pandemic? Um, and also on the cases that we're hearing about, uh, where people have been declared recovered and then it appears that they uh, have the virus again, is there an indication that uh, it doesn't actually give immunity to catching this virus again? Thank you. I can confirm to you, yes, we are on the highest uh, level of alert or the highest level of risk assessment uh, in terms of spread and in terms of, uh, of, of impact. Uh, uh, but uh, that is not in order to alarm or scare people. That is to get countries to understand that your first imported case, it is in your control to contain the virus, to wait to be complacent, to get caught unawares at this point. Uh, and it's, it's really not much of an excuse at this point to get caught unawares. I think we've been <coughs> dealing with this virus for two months now. Uh, and I think this is a reality check for every government on the planet. Wake up, get ready. This virus may be on its way and you need to be ready. You have a duty to your citizens, uh, you have a duty to the world to be ready. Uh, and I think that's what this alert says. It says we can avoid the worst of this but our level of concern is at its highest. To answer your questions around the, um, the, the second question that you had, so we are aware of some case reports of individuals who have patients who have recovered, um, who, are, who have tested negative uh, using PCR testing, but have then go on to test positive for PCR testing. Um, and this requires some further study. So what, what we need to understand is by testing PCR positive, does that actually mean there's viable virus in, in those samples? Are they actually shedding live virus? Um, and that requires some study. So one of the things that we are looking forward to hearing more about in countries that are looking specifically at this are prospective studies following people um, prospectively after they recover for a number of days, if not weeks, to see what that, act, that profile actually looks like. Um, and now we're seeing a large number of people who have recovered, which is very positive. There's more than 36,000 people who have recovered in China alone. I don't know the number offhand outside of China, but this is, this is also very positive. But we need to follow these individuals to see how, they, how well they do. Um, with regards to um, immunity, um, there, this is also actively un, in, under investigation. There are some serologic assays that are being developed. These are newly uh, approved in China and elsewhere. Um, and what scientists are doing right now is that they're looking at the antibody response in people who have had COVID-19 um, to see if they have neutralizing antibodies. The, the data is too preliminary. Right now, we only have a few patients where this is being followed. Um, so as we have more and more recoveries, as we have these studies, the, uh, these actual scientific studies being conducted, we will have more evidence to be able to give you an answer on that. Thank you very much. And for our last question, we'll go to a colleague who we've never had online so far um, asking a question. So that's uh, CBC Canada, please, for, your last, for the last question for the day. Hi, it's uh, Vic Adobe here. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay. Um, yeah, yesterday the FDA uh, put out a notice saying that um, the situation in China is now affecting APIs, the active pharmaceutical ingredients in drugs. What uh, expectation does the WHO have in drug supply disruption uh, because of the situation in China? Um, our um, Access to Medicines Essential Health Technology Group and under the leadership of uh, Marie Angela Samo, uh, have been monitoring the uh, the impact on supply chains, particularly for APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients, uh, and we have similar concerns. Uh, we do believe, though, with the uh, decreasing incidence in China, that many of the companies and the the, uh, who do produce these APIs are beginning to come back online. So while there is a big slump in supply, we believe that is being switched on again. Uh, we continue to monitor that, but we do share your concerns, especially for uh, generic essential medicines around the world. Uh, and many, many people in the world rely on those types of medicines for, for chronic diseases. 
but we are monitoring it and we will continue to do so and we hope that uh, those industries who in China in particular who produce these intermediate products where are coming back online and that we can end this uh, slump in supply as quickly as possible all right with this I thank you all very much thanks all for being there for being on and apologize for those questions we couldn't get to um, we'll send the sound files and the statement by Dr. Tedros very soon afterwards. Thank you all and goodbye.